Hello, Global Gardeners, and welcome back for the first show of 2024. I've missed you all over the last couple weeks as we all enjoyed our holidays. I hope the season was wonderful for you. And as we begin this new year, I thought it might be a good idea to start talking about catastrophes, those things that can go wrong in the garden. And for many of us, really teach important lessons. Sometimes it's the things that are really the most difficult in the garden that differentiates gardeners from regular people. When things go wrong, gardeners move forward and they garden again, having learned some of those hard lessons. And regular people, well, I don't want to be too rough, but they give up. They don't continue on their gardening journey. And so all of you who can consider yourselves gardeners because you overcome adversity, I salute you and say it is a wonderful fellowship that we have. I'm going to share some of the hardest lessons I've learned over the years, and I hope you'll share some of your lessons so that we can chat about what can go wrong, but what we can learn from it to help, especially the new gardeners out there who haven't encountered some of these lessons that can definitely pose problems. Shout out to Brendan McKay, listening in Adelaide, Australia, probably asleep by now, but I hope you're watching us on reply uh, on replay, Brendan. Let's start with a question from Ebbs. Happy New Year to you. Love your videos. I'm getting a polycarbonate greenhouse this year. Just wondering, does the greenhouse diffuse the sunlight somewhat or actually amplify it? Have a great day. You have a great day too. So when we talk about greenhouses, uh, much really does matter in what kind of covering is on the greenhouse. Now my greenhouse, as you can see behind me right here in the photo, is a polycarbonate material. It's double walled. It does have insulation or an insulation factor because of that double wall. It has UV protection and it does tend to diffuse the sunlight. It's not noticeable if you look at it and the plants certainly can't tell a difference, but it's not direct sunlight because the light has to travel through that polycarbonate. If you have a polytunnel that you're using, like a greenhouse, it's the same thing. That plastic will diffuse the light. Even glass, clear glass in the traditional greenhouses do diffuse the light to a certain degree. What greenhouses do is not amplify the light, they amplify the heat. So, that as the air is warmed by the sun inside the greenhouse, that covering, particularly in a double wall polycarbonate, stays within the greenhouse. And then the air heats up even more. So it's the air temperature that is amplified in a greenhouse, not so much the light that's actually ampl amplified. But good for you. I'm continuing to add more and more videos of me growing in the greenhouse. And I'm finding that I like it much more than I thought I would as I'm learning how to actually garden in a greenhouse more. Shout out to In the Garden with Eli and Kate. And Gardens Happen, wonderful channels here on YouTube. And I encourage that you check them out, of course. It is a snowy, blowy, cold day here in Colorado. Much of the United States will be experiencing some pretty severe winter conditions over the course of this week. Portions of the East Coast are really getting their first snowfall in some areas in two years. We're getting a lot of snow, a lot of wind. Pat pointed out in Trinidad, they're getting get gusts up to, that's Trinidad, Colorado, they're getting gusts up to 80 miles an hour. I've seen gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour already here. I can hear the wind blowing outside. I just posted on Instagram a little while ago going outside. The wind chill here is already well below zero. That's 
colder than minus 18 Celsius. And with those gusts, it's even colder. So it's an inside day. I'm glad that I can share it with you because I don't think I'd rather be anyplace else on a Monday, especially when I can't be outside gardening right now. Ladies Garden and Home says, finally got some snow in Connecticut. Not much, about an inch. That's awesome. Yeah, the um, the the crazy weather we've had in the United States over the last couple of years with snowy regions not getting snow and dry regions getting snow, uh, it, it can be pretty crazy. And that's how I wanted to, to start today was talking about weather. Weather in particular is one of those factors in gardening that we can prepare for but we never really know exactly what's going to happen. And so for those of us that have been gardening for a while, we have learned to keep track of the weather. And Eli and I often chat about being weather geeks. I have two weather stations set up in my garden to monitor what's happening and to keep a historical record of everything from wind to temperature to humidity. All of those are important factors in the garden. And so having a garden journal or having a spreadsheet or having a weather station that collects that data for you, I think is a great way to start tracking the trends of the weather patterns in your garden. And when I talk about tracking the trends, we can start by looking at it from a, a year perspective, a single garden season, so we can see what is happening and what has happened over the course of that season. But particularly for those of us that live in challenging regions like Colorado, I think it's important to track over a series of years. Now, last year, 2023, was an unusual year here in Colorado. So in my area, we typically on average, get about 16 inches of total precipitation over the course of a year. That's rain and snow melt, 16 total inches. Last year, we got 26 inches of precipitation. So 10 inches more of water than is normal. So for someone moving to this region of Colorado and gardening for the first time, you might think, oh, wow, it rains in June. Oh, you get snowfall in January. This is great. I can handle this. I can garden. I can keep my plants growing because that's plenty of moisture. But for those of us keeping records, it was a very unusual year to get that much rain. And I've seen this not only in Colorado, but in discussions with gardeners from all over, that if you garden, particularly in the beginning, you're learning to garden, when you see those weather patterns and the way the pests affect your garden, everything that influences your plants, don't assume that that first year is going to be the way it is every year after that. And that's why I'm always recommending that you experiment and you try new things and that you try to learn different methods of gardening because your garden is not going to be the same from one year to the next. Even in very stable environments, things are going to change and be different. And it can be a very difficult lesson when you have a year with a lot of rainfall, we weren't particularly hot last year either. We didn't get anywhere close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 38 Celsius. Nowhere near those high, high temperatures and a lot more rain. It was a relatively easy year. I had a great garden year last year, as I showed in, in my videos, particularly my tomato harvest were fantastic. There's no guarantee that's going to happen again this year. So if I rely on doing things this year as I did next year, it could be one of those hard lessons. You need to be flexible every day in your garden season when you start to see that things aren't working as you had hoped and maybe the weather in particular 
is not cooperating. Shout out to Gina McGregor, a new member of the Gardner Scott community. Thank you, Gina. I'm so glad you can be part of the community. It's nice to have you here at the, the garden support level. And I look forward to, to seeing you maybe on the Facebook page and some of those other perks that we take advantage of in that community. Uh, let's go ahead and catch up. Let's see. Masabi Gal says, I love my Tempest station. Yeah, that's the weather station. I've got the Tempest weather station. That's what I did a video about. Uh, fits what I have been logging better than the weather reports. Thank you for saying that. I completely agree. The I've got the two weather stations and my Tempest is the one I rely on most. And I have a link to Tempest in the description below. It is so much more accurate than the other weather station. And on some days, completely different than the National Weather Service forecast because the nearest weather station for me is miles away and the Tempest really does do a great job of telling me what's happening in my garden at the moment that I'm taking the reading. Thank you, Sister Homestead. Happy New Year to you. Always nice to see you here. Got seven inches of snow in Waterbury, Connecticut. That's fantastic. I'm sure you can appreciate that when it all starts melting and will improve your garden. Hello, Bud. One of the biggest learnings for me with my weather station database is how much different my weather is at times compared to the National Weather Station eight miles away. Exactly my point. And, you know, it's it's one of those next level gardening activities. Uh, the The spreadsheets that Eli, who lives in Scotland, has shared with me as she monitors her temperature are even more extensive than what I do to track my weather. And I think it makes a big difference. And I, I completely agree with you, bud. It all comes down to the database you develop for yourself and how you choose to use it. It's, it's you, it's your garden, it's your weather, it's your database. Whatever it is you want to track, go ahead and track it. And it can begin with the National Weather Service and their forecasts and, and the reports that you can read in the newspaper each day about what it was like the day before. But if you really do want to take it to another level, start tracking it on a daily basis. I, I did a video oh, about four years ago now, I think, where I was talking about keeping a garden journal and some of the things that you should consider including in the journal. And I interviewed a, a garden buddy from my garden club, and he has been keeping a journal for decades. And he can go back that far and know what the temperature was like and what the wind was like and every factor that was affecting his garden. And, and I had him in that video. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. It may, it may be just a a simple start right now for you as you start tracking some of these trends. But 20 or 30 years from now, you're going to be very glad that you started in 2024 if you're not currently doing it. So that is one of those things to, to really help out and, and take advantage of, of what is in front of you. And there are lots of weather networks that you can tie into. The Weather Underground here in the United States is a great way where you have a number of weather stations reporting and you can find out exactly what's happening in your neighborhood. Even if you don't have your own station, guaranteed there are people around you that do. Eli saying, had to go download it for you as a comparison. We don't get the snow, but last year we got 38 inches of rain. So that, that's a, a, a good comparison. 16 inches of precipitation in Colorado, 38 inches of rain in Scotland. So there may be a, right, a reason why Scotland in, in much of the UK is stereotypically seen as a wet region because it is. So thank you, Jay. There's a, a link to that 15 tips for success with the Garden Journal. And a shout out to Jay and Heidi, the fantastic moderators, as we begin this new year. They're always doing such a great job to keep everything on track. Absolutely fantastic that you are here again today. Bowtie Life says, I love the idea of the Tempest Station. I will have one when budget allows. 
very excited about that. Fantastic. Yeah, you know, and that's when we talk about uh, gardening, and, and this is actually on my list of one of the things I want to talk about, it, it's about the gardening budget and what you are willing to spend money on and what you can wait to spend money on. Now, the more you garden, the more you're going to want to garden more. And you're going to want those tools. And you're going to want the Tempest Weather Station. You're going to want the greenhouse. You're going to want all of the cool things. But don't think that you need all of those tools and all of those extras from the beginning. I started small and I've been gardening for so long now that I've accumulated those things over time. And as I mentioned in the videos I make about the freeze dryer, my freeze dryer was one of those. I wanted a freeze dryer many, many, many years ago, and it took me many, many years to budget for it. Same with the greenhouse, same with the Tempest. And so I, I often, especially when I make those videos, have people say, I can't afford that. Well, sure, most of us can't. But if you budget for those type of things in your garden, then you can take advantage of whatever it is you're budgeting for. When it to tie it back, and the reason it's on my list to the weather here in Colorado, particularly in the summer, we have terrible hailstorms. And I've talked before about losing entire seasons to hail. I have a video about the the end of season hailstorm that just devastated my plants right before I was getting to harvest. That is a very hard lesson to learn that I didn't protect my plants. I knew hail was a problem. I knew hail could devastate my garden, but I didn't take the appropriate measures to protect my garden and then lost everything. And it and it that's happened more than once. So one of the things that I planned for was to build a big part of my garden that is continually protected from hail during the summer. Now, it took decades for me to reach that point. But last year and the year before, the area of my garden that has the hail cloth as a roof to it, I've had no damage to any of my plants from the weather as a result of it. It took a long time to figure out how I was going to do it. But once I did it, I'm so glad that I did it. And looking back, it's like, why didn't I do that 10 years ago? Why didn't I take that effort to, to get the, the support structure in place and then put the hell cloth over it so that I didn't lose an entire season of growing? And that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about as you as you budget for what you're going to do. Would you rather, I think that hail cloth, 25 by 25 piece of the, the hail fabric, I think was like $120. I mean, relatively speaking, it wasn't a lot. But the year before I got that, I lost everything. All of my cucumbers, all of my tomatoes, everything I was growing, I lost the harvest from the hailstorm that rolled through. Was that worth $120 for me to have lost everything? Well, of course. And so think about those lessons that I share with you and that others will share with you. And it may be difficult. It may be a bit painful at times to do some of those corrective actions to keep those devastating events from happening. But when you look back on it, you're probably going to be happy that you did make that decision. And there's Jay again with a link to bad weather in the garden and how I've battled Mother Nature. I, I like to work with Mother Nature. Absolutely. But gardening is an unnatural activity. By cultivating our beds and putting plants in that wouldn't normally grow in our areas naturally, we are battling Mother Nature on a daily basis every time we garden. So you can learn to work with nature as much as possible, but you're never going to be able to do it 
completely. You're going to have to take some of those corrective actions and that's when those lessons are going to come up because if you didn't take those actions, you're going to learn the hard way that maybe you should have. Cast Mix Stuff is saying my husband found a polytunnel greenhouse locally and wanted to get it for us. It's 20 by 20. I suggested we start with a cold frame or something. I've got zero greenhouse experience. This, So this is the other side of it. And I completely agree with you. I can think of three right off the top of my head. And as I think harder, I can think of maybe four or five gardeners I know in my area who got a greenhouse and are not growing in that greenhouse today or next month or any time this season. Because it does take experience and it does take time to figure out how to grow in a greenhouse. That's why I've been making as many of the greenhouse videos as I can. You can't just stick a greenhouse up and expect that you're gonna know what to do and be able to grow all the plants successfully. And I think many, many gardeners, I, I hesitate to say a majority, but based on my experience, it's a very large number of gardeners who get a greenhouse, find out it's more difficult than they expected, or they don't learn what they need to learn to grow in the greenhouse. And the greenhouse becomes a shed that they store their pots and their tools and their, their potting soil in and they never really garden in a greenhouse like they wanted to, because it does take a lot of, of practice and learning to do that. And that's a very hard lesson when you spend the money to get a greenhouse and then it becomes useless as a greenhouse. It's a great shed, but you can usually build a shed for a lot less than it costs to build a greenhouse. So I agree with you that starting small with with a cold frame, with a small polytunnel, just covering your beds with plastic. It's a great way to get some of those initial lessons about heating up the soil, keeping the air warm, protecting your plants, all the things that a greenhouse will do, you can learn on a much smaller scale so that by the time you get a greenhouse, you're ready for it. I, I've, I knew for many, many years that I wasn't ready for a greenhouse. I wanted one, but having grown in the big greenhouse at the school, the Galileo School Garden had a 42 foot dome greenhouse. Having gardened in that much more of an industrial scale greenhouse, I learned that I didn't yet know enough to grow in a small greenhouse in my backyard. And so I spent years, even after having grown in a greenhouse, I spent years learning more about growing so that when I did get my greenhouse, it wasn't going to be a mistake. And I wasn't going to follow that same pattern that so many gardeners I know had followed. So um, starting small, and this holds true in so many gardening activities, especially with those big purchases, starting small is a great way in just about any gardening endeavor that we undertake. If you want to start with raised bed gardening, start with a single raised bed. I had lunch with my buddy Jason yesterday and always loved those chats. I often tell you that, that we'll get together at least on a monthly basis and we just talk about gardening. So we were talking about what we we're going to do this year and all those things that happened last year. And we just had lunch three weeks ago but of course, we're, we're always coming up with new things to talk about. And he has a market garden. He actually has enough produce that he's going to the farmer's market in the summer and selling what he's growing in his backyard. But it's all in the ground or in his greenhouse. He's not growing in raised beds. So we were talking about raised bed gardening yesterday because he wants to start adding some raised beds to his garden. And, and we, we both agreed that this year he should start with one raised bed. He's a very experienced gardener, very productive gardener, but raised beds for him is something new, something that he needs to learn. And it's a good idea to start small. 
many of us have made that mistake where we start big. The first raised bed garden I had were were long rows of beds. I had uh, the beds were um, a total of about 30 to 35 feet long, and I had three rows, and that was way too much. That was beyond my capability about 25 years ago. And so I learned the hard way that you don't want to start a garden so big that it becomes overwhelming. Many people will give up or many people will cut back to the point that it's no longer enjoyable. So start small so that you don't learn that lesson the hard way. And Jason, being an experienced gardener, knows that with this new activity, he needs to start small. And that's the best way for him to, to approach gardening in a completely new and different way. And I think it's it's definitely important. Milltown Life is saying, oh my gosh, yes, built our greenhouse last year and learning daily how to grow in. No shed here, maybe a cocktail lounge, but I have a ton of plants in there. So uh, yeah, you could turn your greenhouse into a cocktail lounge. That's not bad. And, um, or, or like Eli and Kate have their um, chill couterie. Is that what it is? Um, the, the spot in the garden where they definitely have a spot set aside to sit and relax and chill. And greenhouse could become that if you don't take the time. In the garden with Eli and Kate says, I disagree. That doesn't happen often. Wow. But I think you can learn once you have one. I think the trick is to start small in the greenhouse. Don't go all out straight away. Okay, there you go. Good advice. And Eli and Kate have some awesome videos on, on growing in the greenhouse. I, I still suggest spending time to learn how to garden in a greenhouse, watch all those videos, read the blogs before you get your greenhouse. But but I'll, I'll acquiesce a bit for you, Eli, and say sometimes the best way to learn is to just jump into the deep end. Uh, it, it's it may be easier in a region. And in the UK, there's a lot of polytunnels, a lot of greenhouses, much more than we have here in the United States. And I think a big reason for that is the differences in our weather patterns, where you have cooler weather for a longer period of time, maybe cloudier days for a longer period of time. Your greenhouse definitely allows you to grow plants you wouldn't be able to grow otherwise. Whereas for many of us, particularly me in this region of Colorado, as as you saw in that recent video, the greenhouse heats up so quickly in the summer and can cool down so dramatically in the winter that that's why I say it really needs to, to be one of those things that you learn how to do before you get it because some of those gardeners I know that no longer garden in the greenhouse is because they fry their plants. They can't control that excessive heat and it's easier to turn it into a shed. So there you go. Spend your first year watching and working with just one small part of it. Good advice, good advice. And same idea as starting with one raised bed. Whatever you're gonna be doing new, start small. That way, the mistakes that you will make hopefully will not be so big that they will influence you and make you not move forward. It's easier to make a mistake in a small section so that when you enlarge it, it's no longer a mistake. It's a lesson that you've learned. Thukad saying, what gardening rabbit holes do you find the most interesting to learn about but you never plan to attempt or it's for a completely different context? like rooftop gardening. Um, so uh, I, I would say some of the, and, and it kind of falls into the category of roof, rooftop gardening. Uh, in there, there are many urban areas, particularly in the west, east coast of the United States that are doing gardening in uh, containers. And, and, and I'm not talking the containers like a grow bag that you put your potatoes in. I'm talking about the transport containers like you see on the big ships that are traveling the globe, taking goods from one country to another. Those big containers are being repurposed into gardens. And some of those gardens are four, five containers tall. And I think those containers are 
10 feet in height, maybe a little bit more than that. And so there, it's, <laughs> I've spent hours with this topic in particular, something I will never do, but just amazes me to take these old uh, containers and fit them with lights and water and stack them and they're automated. And particularly in some urban areas that aren't set up for gardening, they're growing food for neighborhoods. And there are uh, some of these container gardens that are growing foods for restaurants. So that's one of those rabbit holes that I found myself wanting to learn more about, even though it's completely different than anything I've ever done or will ever do. And that's one of the cool things about gardening is there's just so many different ways to do it that if you're like me and you want to learn as much as you can about everything gardening, you look into the, the containers that have lights and the self-contained hydroponic system. And it makes me think about potential of what I could do at some point but it certainly won't be in a cargo container. Uh, it just may be in a much smaller hydroponic context or maybe something I designed for my greenhouse. You just never know. But some of those rabbit holes can be fun as you, as you learn more and more about it. Bud saying, I think many people don't realize a greenhouse is great in the spring and fall, but must have shade in the summer. Absolutely. And, and particularly for my area, here in Colorado with those excessively hot summers, it, it really is better suited, I agree with you, for, for spring and fall. And uh, we don't have to worry about the, the excesses. But that being said, the, the tomato plants that I grew in my greenhouse last year were completely protected from hail. They were completely protected from the deer. And so growing in the greenhouse in the summer was possible. I just had to take a lot of effort to keep my greenhouse cool with the shade cloth, with the ventilation, with almost hourly control to try to keep the greenhouse from getting too hot. And that's where the learning comes in because I think there's a lot of uh, experience that can be gained, like Eli says, starting small that we don't usually do. We jump in and try to do too much and then you fry all your plants because it gets too hot because you didn't know that you should shade inside the greenhouse or that you need to start ventilation. I show uh, in, a, in a video I did this last year, I'm up at six o'clock in the morning opening up the vents and the doors in my greenhouse so that it cools off the second the sun comes up in the morning. So greenhouses are great, but they can take a lot of effort. Thank you, Brian. Brian is so generous. I has gifted five Gardner Scott memberships, and this is, isn't the first time that Brian has done that. So happy new year to you, Brian, and thank you for that. You are a wonderful gardener. And as I've said many times before, I think gardeners are wonderful people as they share not only their knowledge, but in this case, something that others can benefit from by, by having a membership in our members only community. So thank you so much for that, Brian. Brian saying, going to give the farmer's market this summer a go. Awesome. Seedlings, birdhouse, gourds, produce, worm products. Good for you. You'll have to report back, Brian, and let us know how that goes. It can be a lot of work to, to do a farmer's market and to have that, that regular input, but it's very rewarding. I worked with Jason. So Jason uh, is, is not only a gardener, He's also a chef, and, and, and he does that as a profession. He's one of the, the chefs for a local school district. And so I actually worked with him at the farmer's market a couple times this last year. One time at uh, a booth that he had set up with other chefs. And so he was using some of his produce, and I actually took some of my produce to the farmer's market, and then the chefs were cooking it up. Oh, it was fantastic. It was a great day. But what I gain, I think, most from participating in those farmers markets is just talking to the people and just being part of that, that environment where people are looking for things like fresh produce. And then others like us are 
distributing the fresh produce. So good for you, Brian. I, I anticipate that you'll like it a lot. Buked's wondering, what advice do you have for accessible gardening? My father's recovering from a stroke and I'm heading down to make him some raised beds, three and a half feet tall. Do you have experience with that? Yes, I do. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I've talked about this occasionally. So when I, when I, I built the garden at the Galileo School of Math and Science, the students that used the garden the most were the special needs kids. And, and many of them had mobility issues. There was one girl in particular who was in a wheelchair and I did exactly what you're talking about. I did a, a few things. So actually built some of those beds so they were at wheelchair height. So she could, she could sow the seeds, she could water the plants, she could do some of the actual um, weeding and harvesting that I think is so important for kids to learn. And those beds were, were designed to be at wheelchair height. And also the rows between the beds, I think are often overlooked. And so most of the garden area, I used wood chip mulch, which is not the best for wheelchairs. But in that particular area of the garden that was made completely accessible, I didn't have any mulch, so it didn't interfere with the movement of wheelchairs. I had a nice hard packed surface and the beds were far enough apart that the wheelchair could be moved between all of the different beds. And I gave a number of tours to uh, senior citizen groups and did the same thing in that area and showed them how they could garden. And, and some of them were in walkers and canes and the same idea, designing the height of the bed and the space between the beds so that the accessibility was not an issue and the surface was suitable for anybody to walk or roll without any obstruction. So, so those, those are really the big things. Uh, the, the sturdiness of the bed, I think, is important because I've encountered that as well. If you're going to make a tall bed, I prefer doing it with wood as opposed to metal. Now, I have a metal bed that is 32 inches high. And I think I mentioned it last year, I'm planning to do a video on accessibility in the garden. And I'll be talking about the high beds using my 32 inch bed. And the height makes it accessible to people who have difficulty bending over or kneeling. But the sturdiness of the modular steel beds is just not the same as the sturdy wood two by lumber. And so for, for gardeners who need to lean on the bed and actually use the bed for support, I would recommend making it out of solid wood rather than metal. So there are some of my thoughts <clears throat> and uh, particularly uh, with the father recovering from a stroke, uh, I might suggest having that support that he can lean against the bed or sit on the bed uh, as necessary. The, the wood definitely makes a, a big difference. Big Wheel Dog 82 says, I started with a four by eight foot raised bed, but quickly had to build um, a fort around it to protect it from a rambunctious husky. There you go. That That's also one of those hard lessons learned. I've always had my gardens with my dogs and I've learned the hard way many things that need to be done. Uh, again, this year, I, I, you can see in the garden, the garden behind me, I've got hoops over beds. This is a bed that I've got um, some uh, cabbage growing in and, and a few other things. On the other side, I've got a bed. I've got some garlic growing in. In the beds that I have plants actively growing, I have to cover them with my cattle panel hoops because Mala gets in those beds as she chases the, the animals across the yard and digs for gophers. And I'm going to have to put a fence around my garden area, this area, the vegetable garden area, because I love Mala. She's great at keeping some of those pests out, but she also does enough damage to the plants and to the soil that I need to protect it. And, and you have to learn that the hard way. Like you said, build a fort around the bed because the dogs will get in there 
and they will mess things up. The, the chocolate lab I had Chaka many years ago when I buried the fish underneath my corn plants to try to see how effective it was going to be, she dug up that whole section of the garden to get to the fish. Dogs will be dogs. So uh, difficult lessons to learn. What I learned from that is that I don't bury fish in my garden if the dogs have access to it. So there's always a lesson whenever you have those those events that totally upend everything you thought you knew about gardening. And who would have thought that dogs can be such an issue when we're we're bringing them out to our garden? Because for most of the time, most of my dogs just lie still and watch the gardening. It's when you're not around that it really can be more of an issue. Hey, thanks, Jay. Yeah, forever garden beds are the ones that that I use and yeah, the code gardener scout will get you 10% off of those. And that's where I got the, the 32 inch high uh, metal bed and, and also the low beds, like the one you see behind me um, that I have a long couple long low beds. Those are the forever garden beds and really like their quality uh, and, and what they're doing. So, Hey, grow big TV has signed on Joe and Corky are wonderful to watch. So thank you for, being here today, Dan Galamidi saying, lesson learned. When I started my raised beds in 2022, I ordered 50-50 topsoil compost mix. Plants started to yellow and die. Found out the mix was too dense and nutrient deficient. Great lesson. And yes, soil is so important in the garden. And there are so many lessons to be learned from the, the soil. I, I uh, was uh, looking at some of the comments that uh, that have been posted earlier about filling beds with, uh, this was on the, the Facebook channel uh, in the Gardner Scott community, about filling a bed with a potting soil, going to the store, buying a bag of potting soil, filling it or filling your bed with it, and then finding out that the plants yellow and die. And like Dan says, ordering topsoil, filling your beds with a 50-50 mix, and then the plants yellow and die. Just because you're putting something called potting soil or potting mix or garden soil, there's all these, these names that are similar, does not mean that it can support your plants. And especially if it's too dense, the plants are going to have trouble. But much of the compost that you're going to find in bagged products, and even like me, if you order a mix to be delivered from uh, a local uh, rock company. They're usually the ones with the dump trucks that load or unload the soil in your yard. That compost may be fresh, not completely decomposed. And so there's a couple things. First off, a compost that is not finished isn't loaded with a lot of nutrients and it's loaded with a lot of uncomposted com un or not decomposed material. And the decomposition process requires nitrogen. Well, when you put a fresh compost or unfinished compost in your soil and then grow plants in it, it's going to continue to decompose. And in the process, it's going to take nitrogen from the soil to complete that decomposition. The plants need nitrogen. That's why they're yellowing in most cases, because the, the rough material, often it's wood-based, that you're getting in some of these mixes is robbing your soil of nitrogen. And the plants now have no nitrogen. So you can still use the bagged mixes, and you can still use a custom delivery like that, but you probably need to think about adding extra fertilizer, particularly the nitrogen component of a fertilizer so that your plants will, will grow the way you're expecting. So yeah, hard lesson to learn because you think you're doing everything right with that good soil, but that good soil is not good yet. That's a big reason why I like to amend my beds in fall so that I have at least six months for that material to continue to decompose for the nutrients to be released into the soil before I'm going to be putting my plants in the ground. And after you do that a few years, then your soil is good enough. You don't need the fertilizer. But in the beginning, 
you may need to supplement with the fertilizer to overcome some of those issues, particularly with that nitrogen deprivation that that is a hard lesson to learn. Okay, I, I know I'm falling behind, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll forward and see what I can catch up with. The big Will Dog 82 saying, now that I am four years into gardening, I've learned I can drive my wife crazy with my winter prep planning. I blame my military training. Good for you. You know, I, I'll blame my military training too, because you all know who watch on a regular basis that I'm always talking about planning. I'm always talking about preparation. And I'm always talking about doing that well in advance. And yes, that's one of those things we we learn in the military. There were some missions that I flew and the planning for the mission took longer than the mission itself took. And so that's the way I approach gardening. My planning for the garden is often four, five, sometimes six months of preparation. And my actual season is only three or four months long. So uh, I <laughs> don't know about making your wife crazy. Hopefully she can deal with it. But I I don't disagree with you the importance of some of that prep and planning. And it definitely should be done ahead of time. And the military is one of those things that helps us learn that along the way. For those of you without that military training, this comes into that same category of hard lessons learned where you want to grow something. I've talked about this in some of my videos as well, that you're planning to grow your garden. There are the plants that you want to put into your garden and you go to get the seeds and find out that it's too late. That some of those plants that you wanted in your garden, like peppers, for instance, peppers, if you're going to start from seed indoors, take 10 to 12 weeks before your last frost date. And many of us, particularly me, like to plant two weeks after our last, last frost date. So I'm starting my peppers 14 weeks before they're going to go in the ground. That's four and a half months. And so for some of you who are going to be putting peppers into the ground in March, if you don't have your pepper seeds started indoors right now, it might be too late, or at least maybe you're stretching things a little bit. It's going to be a late pepper planting this year. Well, you don't necessarily know that that's a problem unless you do the, the prep work well ahead of time, months ahead of time. And that's why I say I'm planning four or five and six months in advance of what I'm doing. Most of my garden isn't going to be planted until the first week of June. And this is the first week of January. And I'm putting my list together of what I'm going to be growing and figuring out when the seeds need to be started. So a lot of attention, I think, should be paid to that. And you, you don't learn about it until you've done it one year and realize you missed an entire year of growing something that you were looking forward to. Next year, you do it the, the better way because you learn that lesson the hard way. So many lessons of that. And Garden and Jake, I appreciate that. You are, you are very, very generous in the gratitude. Thank you so much for that. So Emma is saying zone eight is probably starting seeds now. Um, you can't break it down by zone. And I'm working on a video right now, actually, to, to talk about this. Hardiness zones have nothing to do with when to start your seeds. It's all about your last frost date and when your growing season begins. And that has nothing to do with the hardiness zones. The hardiness zones are all about the coldest winter temperatures. It has nothing to do with when the temperatures warm up in springtime. So zone eight is, is able to grow many plants year round, depending on what plants you are growing. But as to when your season begins, the first big factor is that last frost date in spring. When we're talking about the tomatoes and the peppers and the squash and the melons, all of those plants that can be damaged by frost, 
You don't want to put them into your garden until after all danger of freezing conditions. So that's why we, we target the start of our season using that last frost date. But for other plants like spinach and broccoli and kale and lettuce and turnips, those cool season plants can handle a frost. And so you can put those in the ground before your last frost date. What's important is to learn what that time frame is. And I have a number of videos that discuss exactly how to plan your seed starting and which seeds to start when, because you can, you can put your onions in the ground as plants weeks before your last frost date. But if you're going to be growing onions from seed, you're going to have to start many, many weeks before you put them in the ground indoors. So January for many people is the time of year to start onions from seed indoors. And then they're transplanted outside maybe sometime in April. If you're in a, a region like mine where the last frost date is in May. If your last frost date is in April, then you might want to start your onion seeds in December and put them out in March. And this is what I'm talking about, where if you wanted to grow onions from seed this year, it depends on your last frost date as to whether you still have time or maybe it's a little bit late for that. So learn your dates and learn what is best to grow in your area at an appropriate time. That's why it's always a good idea to to talk to local nurseries, get to know other local gardeners and find out what they do and what they've learned over time. And that's really a good way to, to make that approach. <clears throat> Lama Lama saying, a good example is I'm in zone 8A, but my last frost isn't, isn't until the last week of May to first week of June. And my first frost can be as early as mid, late September. Great example, because I'm in zone 4 5B, 30 degrees colder than you. And my last frost date is the last week of May too. So completely different hardiness zones between the two of us, but our last frost date is essentially the same time. And so that's a great example. Thank you for posting that because it really makes a difference as to when you're going to be putting in the garden, not how cold your winters are getting. So good example. Um, Emma is saying, do you taste much of a difference between kale grown during the summer and winter? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, at least I think so. So uh, kale being a cold loving plant for the most part struggles during the summer. And depending on the variety you're growing, it may even bolt. But the, the stress that that kale, and you see this with lettuce and spinach, particularly those leafy greens, when they're exposed to the hot temperatures of summer, they get bitter. The plant is actually stressed and it affects the chemicals within the leaves. And you're going to taste that. When they're growing during the cool months, the, the conditions that they prefer it's going to be much sweeter and a completely different flavor. You see this with root vegetables as well. And so I think growing a fall garden is one of the best things to, to demonstrate the, the taste difference in, in the vegetables that we're growing. We know that the tomatoes and the peppers, of course, are going to taste better in summer when you harvest them fresh on a warm summer day. But if you start carrots, rutabagas, turnips, beets, all those root vegetables, if you start them in summer, as the conditions cool, and then you get that first freeze, like Lama Lama was mentioning, you get that first freeze in September or October, the plant is, is so much sweeter. And, and what I mean by the plant, the, the harvest, the root, because the plant now is stressed by the cold temperatures. And what it does is it sends all the starches that become sugars into the root for storage over the winter. And you harvest a, a beet after it's been exposed to frost. I think it's much tastier 
much better than if I harvested the same beet weeks before when the weather was hot. So uh, yeah, when you grow your plants and when you harvest your plants, there is a correlation, depending on the plant, to the temperatures and the weather that those plants are going to be exposed to. CJ Don is asking, I just had my first grandbaby. Congratulations to you. That's exciting. So I have to include travel plans during the gardening season. I'm going to research auto watering systems. Uh, that's a great idea. Yeah, the um, the travel, that's one of the issues I have as I travel to see my grandbabies in Louisiana is figuring out what you're going to do with your garden. And I have a house sitter who loves to water my plants. So that's one option that I take. And my grandbabies and daughter will also come and help me water. That's the approach I tend to take. But uh, an auto watering system, definitely look into that because you don't want to miss out on the opportunity of seeing that new grandbaby. It is definitely a highlight in life when, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting, I think, because gardening is such a big part of my life. I know it's a big part of your life as well. But when I'm sitting there with my new granddaughter on my lap, I'm not thinking about gardening at all. I don't want to say it's the last thought on my mind, but it's definitely not present like it is most days of the year. You're focused on the grandbaby, and that's really what it's all about. So uh, definitely take full advantage of that and try to figure out how to garden. Uh, and you know, and and that's that's one of those lessons learned. I've I've set up some automatic watering systems in the past. I've I've had some drip systems. I've had I've done things to try to keep the plants watered if I was going to be gone for a day or two, and then come back and find out that the system didn't turn on, I didn't have the timer set correctly, it wasn't enough water, it was a hotter day than expected, lots of different reasons, but but I've lost plants. I've killed plants by neglecting them when I was gone because I didn't have that good plan in place. Having a plan is definitely important. And even when you have a plan, this is on my list of one of those hard lessons learned, that when we are starting our seeds indoors, it's easy to become complacent. We go down and water our, or add water to our flats every day. Our plants are doing great. And particularly when we have the, the humidity dome over our young seedlings that help keep everything nice and moist and the plants are doing well. And I've mentioned this a couple times in the past, I think it's three or four years ago now, I lost my entire crop of peppers that year because one day I was upstairs thinking I should go downstairs to water the seedlings. And I thought, no, they looked so good yesterday I think I can probably get by without adding water today. Big mistake. I should have at least gone down to check on them and then decided if I needed to add water. But by ignoring those seedlings for just that one day, the soil dried out, killed all those young pepper seedlings, lost my entire plan for that year because of one day being just a little too lazy to actually go down the stairs and see how things were looking. Tough lesson that to lose all those plants. And because the timing is so critical, particularly for something like pepper plants, I didn't grow the pepper plants that I wanted that year. I bought a few plants just so I would have them, but I didn't have the dozens that I was looking forward to. So definitely something to, to consider as to, uh, what lessons you think you might be learning. Sometimes it's as simple as just ignoring your plants too much. In the garden with Eli and Kate is saying, I knew about harvesting after frost and it affecting flavor, but I actually didn't know why. There you go. Yeah, the, it's it's all about the, the starches and sugars and the way that the roots are storing that for the winter. So now you know. Gardens happen to saying Ethiopian kale is an interesting plant. Instead of getting bitter when the weather gets warm to start it to start, it starts tasting more like a mustard leaf. Uh, interesting. So I, I actually, uh, if you saw my most recent video 
or actually two videos ago where I was talking about starting fresh this year with all new varieties. Ethiopian kale has been recommended to me by a, a couple gardeners. So it's actually on my list. It's made the finals for something that I might be growing. And now that you mention it, I may end up trying Ethiopian kale this year because we get such hot, dry conditions here in my part of Colorado that uh, I think I might just have to try it. Thank you for saying that. Ram Amandeep is saying installing my 16 zone auto watering system last year was a good idea. There you go. So if you're wondering about automatic watering, uh, it can definitely make a big difference. I I like going out and hand watering. I just love being close to my plants. I can see the insects before they become a problem. I can just give those plants all the love and attention they need. And I just like hand watering. But I recognize that that's not something every gardener can do, especially if you have a big garden. And so a 16 zone auto watering system tells me you've got a big garden. And so kudos to you for setting up something like that. I, I, I think that would make things so much easier on so much levels for me. I just like doing the work. But for many gardeners, it can make a big difference in whether you're going to garden or not, because you may not have all the time that you want to be using. Sherry's saying, I used a fly spray system from my horse barn in North Carolina to power my garden watering system. Interesting idea. Uh, I've, I've looked into when we had uh, a horse barn uh, a number of years back, we had the solar powered uh, boxes that powered the electrical fence to help keep, there were some areas we had to keep the horses in. So we had an electrified fence that was powered by a, a big panel. And uh, I've looked into those as a possibility for adding power to my greenhouse. And so great idea. Yeah, there's a lot of systems used in barns that <laughs> surprisingly can be transferred to the garden. And the idea to power a watering system, I like that idea. I may, I may have to look into that a little bit more. That's one of the big issues I have in my garden is it's just so far from the house that I have to run hoses and then I have to figure out where I'm going to put the timers and set up that watering system. But to tie it into a horse system, um, that's a good idea. I, I really like that. You got me thinking, talking about rabbit holes to go down. I think I that might be a new rabbit hole for me is to start looking into something like that to help power up and, and give me a more automatic system, at least in some sections of my garden. Interesting. Colorblind Gardener saying, with my back issues, an auto watering system combined with a heavy mulch covering is the only way I can garden. I can barely, don't really keep up with the plants growing without weeding and watering. Good. There, another another great example. On the, and, and, and to my point, yeah, not everybody can get out and do the gardening like I do it. And I, I never suggest that you do things exactly like I do it. But uh, figuring out your workarounds, that is the solution. And absolutely, especially I agree with you, uh, an automatic watering system is, is so much less efficient until you add mulch. And then it becomes pretty much a walk away and let it take care of your plant kind of system. So good for you. Cass is saying, make sure you run any auto watering system for a week or so before you leave. Iron out the kinks. I didn't, and a hose burst on day two of a two-week trip. Ten thousand gallons of water before the neighbor caught it. Uh, yeah, that's that's similar to what happened to to me that I was talking about. The system not working right as well. I've had I've had systems break. So excellent advice. Excellent advice. Start it, try it, work it, tweak it before you head out and tell your neighbors you're leaving. I, I in the garden this last year, as a matter of fact, saw my neighbors having a geyser of water in their backyard. And I was there to call and say, hey, are you home? Did you know that you've got water gushing out in your backyard? And they said, we're in the Virgin Islands on vacation. Luckily, 
they had a son in the local area that they could call and fix the problem. But uh, yeah, get your neighbors involved and definitely try it out ahead of time because you don't want to come back. 10,000 gallons is a lot. And it's one of those things that for those of us who are paying a lot for water, that, oh man, 10,000 is beyond, I think, my annual use in the garden. That would be very restic restrictive to be able to handle that financially. So thank you for that. Jay is saying, as I age and my multiple disabilities set in, I'm adapting my garden infrastructure for less physical ability. Good plan. And, and, and I'm trying to do that more and more as well, Jay, uh, because I'm starting to reach that point myself. But I, like I said, I've been working on this video for a while now, and I really want to try to help gardeners figure out how, how to do things be, when the physical ability starts to, to diminish. So uh, you'll have to keep us updated with some of the things that you're doing because it's important that we, we change the way we garden. It's, it needs to be done. If you, if you expect that you're going to be gardening the same way your whole life, that's another lesson that's going to be hard to learn. You do have to modify what you do as you age for a number of different reasons. And, it, and it's not necessarily health related. It's not necessarily accessibility related. It could just be how much time you have to devote to it, or maybe your interests change, or the fact that your garden is so much bigger when you're older than it is when you were young and starting small. So anticipate that you will have to change aspects of your gardening, which is another reason to learn as much as you can. Learn about all those different methods and start incorporating some of that. You know, I'm, a, I'm occasionally asked, you know, what's, what's my favorite way to garden or how do I garden? And there's no simple answer for that. I've got in-ground beds. I've got raised beds. I've got soaker hoses. I hand, hand water. I've got a greenhouse. I, I have all kinds of different garden areas that are mulched differently. The plants are different. And so I'm doing a lot of different stuff that I've picked up over the years. There isn't a single answer I can give as to how I garden. It depends on which area of the garden you're asking me about. And so expect that, anticipate that. I actually look forward to learning about new methods and trying new things. But as you get older, in particular, you may be forced to do things differently when you really weren't expecting it to be that way. So Gina McGregor saying, I agree, thick degraded straw mulch has saved my crops. Absolutely, get no rain May through October. And um, the, the, the thick, and, and I use a lot of straw in my vegetable garden, but around my fruit trees, I've got six inches of wood chip mulch. And absolutely, they save my trees every year that mulch does. Because this last June, we got a crazy amount of rain, like I mentioned. But normally, the year before, I don't think we got any rain in the month of June. And that's why it's important to notice the trends and keep track of what's happening in your garden. Because if you have a year that's really wet, and you expect it's going to be the same the next year without something like a thick straw mulch or a thick wood chip mulch. If you keep doing things the same way, the plants are going to suffer and you might actually lose plants because they're not getting enough moisture. Bohemian Herbology Natural Solutions is saying, great lesson I learned too. Not hurting yourself and taking breaks is a good thing. Uh, yeah, good example. It takes me longer to garden today than it did five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago because I take a lot more breaks and I do things slower intentionally because I don't want to hurt myself and and I want to enjoy gardening for as long as possible. And so taking the breaks is definitely a good thing. Wonderful advice and something that we can all learn from. And, and another one of those lessons that I've learned the hard way and, and I remember talking about this last year in one of these live streams where I was out for like seven or eight hours straight working and hurt myself. 
and was out of action for like three days recovering my back because I just felt so good. I wanted to push it and then it started hurting and I wanted to finish. And then it got hurt to the point that I missed out on days of activity. So if, if it's important enough to be done, take time doing it. And my whole gazebo project, when I was putting bricks in and, and laying out that whole thing, I could have done it in a much shorter amount of time, but I took a lot of breaks and got it done right without hurting myself. And that's what I would highly recommend for everyone who is doing any type of physical labor in the garden. Sherry's saying, please caution people using straw from commercial fields where pesticides have been sprayed. Yeah, I have a video about this. I'm sure Jay will find it and put it up pretty soon about the uh, amino pyrrolids, that family of pesticides and herbicides, not so much the pesticides, the herbicides are really more of a concern uh, because they'll kill the plants. Pesticides can also be a concern because it, they can lessen some of the beneficial insect populations in your garden. So whenever I use straw, I have it sitting in the back of my garden for months and months and months before I actually use it as a mulch. When you look into many of those synthetic chemicals that are being used as either a pesticide or an herbicide, they don't last forever. They do have a half-life. And so you can research that, find out what that half-life is and how long it will take for that chemical to dissipate in the air, on the straw, and in the soil. Because usually the studies will, will have different numbers for where the chemicals are going to be used. And once it gets into the soil, most of those chemicals are going to be counteracted by the soil bacteria pretty quickly. But it can be an issue for the plants and the insects in your garden when you use it as a mulch. So age it. Let the sun break it down. Let the rain break it down. And then by the time you put it into your garden, it's going to be less of a problem. So I like to age my straw for at least a year before I put it in my beds. And uh, I haven't mentioned this. In fact, um, I've been trying to figure out how to incorporate it into a video as we move forward. But my beds right now don't have straw on them. And so all these beds in this picture I took this morning, uh, well, a couple of the beds have a, lot, a light layer of straw. But the reason I didn't put straw on these beds is for exactly that. I don't know the source. I asked the manager, nobody at the store knows where the straw comes from or what it might have been treated with. And so I'm letting my straw age before I put it on my beds. And I don't like going into winter with my beds uncovered, but I would be more concerned if that straw contaminated my soil because I didn't know what was in it. This is that one of those hard lessons learned. I. I haven't learned it the hard way. This is because I'm taking those precautions because I learned about it. It hasn't affected me, but I know gardeners who have lost their plants because they mulched with a straw that was contaminated and it killed all their plants. So um, good, good recommendation, Sherry, that we be aware of the fact that the straw we buy commercially could be contaminated and it could affect our plants. Doesn't mean not to use it. I love straw as a mulch. You just have to use it in a way that it's not going to damage the plants. And I do that from the, the aging. Big Will Dog 82 says, garden helps me deal with my chronic pain issues. Good. Good to hear that. Went all in on indoor growing this winter. Still eating fresh tomatoes from summer plant cuttings. That is awesome. That is fantastic. And I'm, I'm so glad you're able to keep the gardening going, especially in the winter time with tomatoes. Uh, fantastic for you. And shout out, definitely. Jay has got the link. There you go. Should you be concerned by garden herbicide contamination, specifically the amino pyrrolids that are in those herbicides? So thank you for posting that, Jay. Isn't this wonderful? Don't we have wonderful moderators and the community in general to be passing all this around? Uh, it's it's one of those things that it's the sharing of the information, the sharing of the hard lessons learned 
that really can make a difference for all of us. One of the reasons I learned about the straws because of knowing people that had issues with the straw. So when I started using straw, their lesson learned the hard way benefited me. So it wasn't something I would have a problem with. Hey, Tony, Tony from Simplify Gardening is on here as well. And don't worry about being late. I'm so glad that, that you're here to join us. Got a great group today and a wonderful way to, to start the new year. Over 200 people are on the stream right now. That's fantastic. And I'll give you a little bit of a teaser. Tony's going to be a guest on the show in a few weeks. We've got big news to announce. So uh, we we finalized the date yesterday. And so I always have fun when Tony's on the show. And I was on Tony's live stream a few weeks back. And so you can look for that in the weeks ahead. Col Colorblind Gardener says, shredded brown wax-free cardboard like Amazon boxes makes a great mulch. Have a couple trash cans full right now, waiting for the weather to clear enough to get out there. Good suggestion. Yeah, Kong, or the cardboard, especially if you have a, a method of shredding it, um, can be a great option. And even if you don't shred it, uh, you can use ca the cardboard laid flat on your beds, dig a hole in the cardboard and plant in the hole. And you've now mulched your garden bed with cardboard and planted in it. So uh, definitely a way to reuse. I've, I've got way too much cardboard in my garage because I'm doing some experimentation in the garden with the cardboard. And that's just one of the ways that you may see in a future video of what you can do with cardboard in my garden, at least is using it as a mulch. The, the big issue I have uh, is the winds. <clears throat> wet cardboard, you need to keep the cardboard wet for it to really be an effective mulch. And if you don't, if you just let it dry out one day, like a day like today we're having with winds in excess of 50 miles an hour, the cardboard's going to blow away if you don't have a way to anchor it. So great mulch, but there are some extra precautions to take to make sure it doesn't blow away and it doesn't dry out and that your gardens are, or your plants are going to be happy in the garden when you're using something like that. Uh, Masabi Gal's wondering, anybody try weed whacking cardboard in a garbage can to break it up? Um, I haven't tried that. Uh, it's an interesting idea. It, the, uh, I know that in areas where I've had cardboard on the ground, my weed whacker did not damage the cardboard. It damaged wet cardboard. It didn't damage the dry cardboard. So. Uh, interesting idea. I might have to experiment with that, putting wet cardboard in a garbage can and then using the whacker to shred it up. Interesting. I, I haven't tried that. If anyone else has, by all means, um, share what has happened with you. So yeah, Tony Simplified Gardening, looking snowy there. Tried here today, but glad it held off. I have stuff to do. Yeah, I've got stuff to do too, but it's not happening today. Uh, I took this picture this morning uh, lots of wind, the, the snow, not a lot of snow, but you can see the snow drifts are beginning to pile up. A few hours ago, my greenhouse was already starting to get covered with snow that was being blown in the wind. So yeah, this is today's picture of my garden this morning and it is snowy. It is cold and I am not going outside and doing anything in the garden. So Glad you can at least get out and get some things done. Patina saying, hubby was turning over compost, found and harvested volunteer Peruvian purple fingerlings and beets. Win-win. Fantastic. It's so nice when you have those kind of things. I, it, you, you probably don't remember, but a whole year ago, I said I wasn't, or I guess two years ago, two years ago, I said I wasn't going to be growing potatoes. And I had the same thing happen with the soil in, in my greenhouse specifically and had potatoes growing from the bagged mix that I was using to grow potatoes in the year before. <clears throat> and I grew potatoes in that year without planning for it because it is a win-win when you can discover stuff like that. And it often happens in the compost pile or with that, that reused soil, like in my case, it was being reused from 
uh, the grow bags. And so absolutely win-win. So good for you. That can be a lot of fun. I, I hope they do well for you. Uh, yeah, Sherry says sheets of cardboard become kites here unless they're under some weight. So that's the limitation when doing the cardboard uh, as a mulch. But but definitely, definitely is one of those things that you can you can do. Nancy Rudy is saying it had herbicide contamination in black cow compost one year too. And I think I talk about that in that video that, that Jay just put the link to. Um, I know I've talked about it in other videos as well. Uh, that's what I do with my manures. Whenever I'm going to use manure in the garden, I let them sit. So I, I do know, I'm not sure which video it was that uh, I talked about getting a load of cow manure and it was just sitting in that area that's in front of my greenhouse. And it's been sitting there for two years now. And now this year is the first year that I'll actually be doing any planting in that area for that same reason. The, the manures can have a lot of contamination. And as Nancy says, uh, they experienced it. So be aware of any of those farm products that it could definitely be uh, detrimental and a hard lesson learned when your plants suffer as a result of the, the damage that you unintentionally inflict through a mulch that would normally be great for your garden. Okay. I'm catching up again to get the talking. Wickershire Project Off Grid says five gallon pail, add cardboard chunks, add water, let's soak for 24 hours or more, buy a cheap long metal paint mixer and I like that idea. It does look like a blender. Insert into drill, make cardboard mulch easy. Thank you for that great idea. Yeah, the, the paint mixers are sturdy. It is like a little blender, much, much sturdier than a nylon uh, tip of a weed whacker. So um, thank you. Great tip. I like that idea. And and again, the wet cardboard is going to be easier to break up than the uh, the dry cardboard. So let it soak, break it up. Now you can use it. And, you know, and it's not just, I, I've done that. <coughs> it's funny because it didn't really pop into my mind, but I do that for my worms. I'll, I'll use cardboard soak it and then shred it as a uh, bedding for my vermicomposting for my worms. So yeah, no reason you can't do it on a much larger scale and use that cardboard in other areas of your garden. So, and Kevin, I agree with you. Seems like volunteer plants are more hardy. Yeah, I'm a big believer in letting volunteers grow. If if a potato or a beet or whatever you find in your compost, if it survives for months, particularly the winter, and then you discover it and it wants to grow, oh, absolutely. Those, those plants are often hardier because they have encountered the conditions within your garden and survived and have the opportunity to prosper when you select those plants as the ones that you're going to put in. So uh, wonderful idea. Laura S. says, I layered cardboard and put chopped leaves over it in my pathways and had great luck with weed suppression. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I took pictures of it, actually took video of it, and I don't think I've used it in a video yet, um, but that's what I did when I first laid out the pathways between my wooden raised beds. I did exactly the same thing. I put cardboard down and then put wood chips over. I didn't, I didn't do leaves. I did um, the wood chips and put wood chips over the cardboard and that eliminated all of the plants that were growing between my raised beds. So uh, absolutely great way to use cardboard in the garden is as weed suppression. And in the beds themselves, if you're starting a new raised bed, putting cardboard at the bottom is also a great way to, to do it. Laura's wondering where I got my worms for verbal composting. Um, <clears throat> and so I think it's, is it Uncle Jim? Um, so if you look at my, my worm videos, I think I have a link in the description of my worm videos. Um, but I think it, I think it's uncle Jim's worm farm and, uh, they, they sell by the pound and that's where I got my worms. So just go to my, my, uh, homepage on, on YouTube or do a search for Gardner Scott worm farm and it should bring up that video. And you can see in the description, the link to exactly where I got my worms. 
and and that can help you out wasabi gal is pouring over the prairie moon catalog i love that catalog as a plan for my new meadow where the lawn is in my front yard categorizing color and heights fantastic yeah prairie moon nursery is just fantastic for the, the native plants and they can have so much information there about how to germinate the seeds and how to grow the plants so good for you meadow garden is a wonderful idea and uh, brings in so many beneficial insects when you can do something like that so um, more power to you i hope that that, that turns into a good project and uh, Lawrence is saying, I've been using Uncle Jim's Worm Farm for years. Great source. Yeah, they're they're one of the biggest, at least here in the United States, <coughs> for, for supplying worms and worm products. And I just fed my worms yesterday a whole bunch of leftover lettuce and banana peels. And, and once you have worms, you can keep worms going out a ton of worm castings that I need to harvest so I can mix them into my potting mixes for all those seedlings that, that are going to be growing soon in my garden. Uh, Moondust is asking, how do you revitalize a dirt patch? There's a patch of dirt in the backyard and it's been that way for years. And my sister wants to turn it into a small garden. Parents said nothing will grow there. So I do have a video. It, it's like, um, what's it? I guess it's almost two years ago now um, that I show exactly that. And that's what I was talking about in this area in front of the greenhouse. And that's what the video was about. It's an it's a, a dirt patch. The soil there is terrible. And I want to grow in it. Didn't want to grow in it then. I wanted to grow in this year. And so two years in advance, I just dumped leaves and pine needles and wood chips and I've just kept a really thick mulch over that entire area. When I checked on it this last year, there were already worms populating that area and the soil underneath was already beginning to turn darker brown because of all that organic material on top. So, so revitalizing over time, if you're not in a rush, just dump organic matter on it bags of leaves and wood chips and whatever else you have, throw compost. That's an ideal material to revitalize a patch. If you want to do it much quicker, then you need to uh, start with the area being moist. I, I suggest double digging. I don't do a lot of double digging, except when I'm starting a patch in an area with very poor soil. And that's when you take compost and other organic material and you dig it deep into the soil. One of the, the arguments about digging your garden is that you do a lot of digging, you do a lot of tilling, it disrupts the soil life and it breaks apart the soil structure. That's true. But if you don't have a garden there yet, if you don't have the soil life, if the soil structure isn't built up yet, you can dig or till. Take all that organic matter, work it down as deep as you can, and that's how you revitalize a barren spot of sterile soil. And then from then on, it becomes much easier. You can do no dig and you can put compost and mulch on top and you've got the earthworms and all the soil organisms that will help you from that point on. But in the beginning, it usually involves some physical labor to, to get the, the organic matter into the soil. Pat Patrick, thank you so much for that on this snowy, cold day we're having here in Colorado. Thank you for three years of great gardening content. One of my great lessons is not every YouTube garden channel knows anything about gardening. That is a good lesson. And yes, I completely agree. I've, I've actually been making videos for a lot longer than three years, but I'm glad you've been here for three years. Uh, and one of the reasons I started my YouTube channel and making videos is because of the suggestions that a lot of YouTube channels offer that if you follow those suggestions, the results are not going to be pretty. That That's another one of those hard lessons to learn when you follow the advice of somebody and that advice is not suitable for your garden. So I'm glad I could help you, Pat, and thank you for for the kind words and I'm, I'm glad you're able to 
to have learned from my content and learn to know to question a lot of what you find out there on YouTube. So this is the first live stream of 2024. We've got many, many weeks to come of good information. Like I said, I've got guests coming in the weeks ahead. I already have two, actually have three lined up over the course of the next six weeks. So it'll be me talking about gardening. It'll be me meeting up with different guests talking about gardening, but we're going to be doing it as long as I can continue to do it. And I hope you follow along, of course, with all of that. As I look forward to 2024, and Jason and I were talking about this yesterday, this is one of my favorite times of year as a gardener. And I, I think many of you are falling into this as well, where you're excited. In January, the beginning of the year, for those of us that are going to be gardening in June, the garden year is perfect. Everything is going to work well this year. All of our plants are going to grow to the maximum size. We're going to have more harvest than we know what to do with. The weather's going to be perfect. No insect pests are going to eat our plants. When we start right now as we are, nothing has gone wrong, which means everything is going right. Be careful about that. Because, and that's why I wanted to talk about learning from the hard lessons. When you when you approach gardening with that assumption that everything is going to go right, and I feel that right now, I have no reason to think that this garden season isn't going to be perfect. But if you go into the entire season without slowing down, paying attention, keeping track of weather trends, figuring out what insects might be uh, exploding in population this year in your garden. When you don't start observing and then making corrective action early, it's going to become a hard lesson, something that you wish you had done sooner. So begin now. Expect that the weather is going to be terrible. Expect that the insects are going to eat all of your plants. Expect that there's going to be problems in the garden. Plan for it. Prepare for it. And then if it doesn't happen, it is going to be a perfect garden year. Last year, I did so much more additional protection of my beds for hail. And I didn't get the hail. Knock on wood, it won't happen again this year. But I did not get the hail last year. If it did come, I was ready. It didn't. I was so happy. My plants did so well. That's what I'm talking about. Be prepared. And if it doesn't happen, yeah, you spend a little bit of extra effort. Maybe you spend a little bit of extra money getting some of the, the tools and materials. But now you've got them for next time. And you've got the experience and you've got the education for next time. This year, 2024, is next time. All of us who have gardened in the past, this is a whole new experience, whole new part of our journey ahead. Be ready for whatever comes your way. I look forward to talking to you more about what's coming my way and listening and sharing with your lessons that you can teach me as well. So let's come back Monday next and we'll do it all over again. Thanks for being here. Hope you have a fabulous beginning to your new year and that the year ahead is going to be fantastic as well. I'm Garner Scott. Enjoy gardening.